anything that I can put my hands on. And I don't think that comes, you know, with practice or anything like that, just something that comes naturally. And um, something I'm very thankful of. And I think that um, it's a loan, you know, because it's something that can be taken away from you at any time. Such is his determination, had he followed another route, Lara might now be displaying agility like this for Tottenham Hotspur. Instead, it was a close friend from Trinidad who took that route. Dwight York came over to play on the wing for Aston Villa. Well, he was a good, definitely it was a good plan. I think if, if he had uh, dedicated himself to football, probably who knows what had been the outcome. You can't really fault him now because he seems to be he choose the right sport and things have turned out really well for him. For both soccer and cricket, Queen's Park Oval was his first mecca. But home is here in Kantara, a village in northern Trinidad now invaded by the press and where the windows of his house are endangered daily by small disciples. Or at least will be when they're strong enough to swing a bat and simultaneously keep their trousers up. Brian was born here in May 1969 to Pearl and Bunty Lara, the tenth of eleven children and the only one still unmarried. The saintly Pearl's greatest sadness is that her husband never lived to see Brian represent West Indies. Bunty died in 1988 when Lara was still twelfth man. That is a great motivating force. He, 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 he loves his father and, and as a matter of fact, he says that um, the one thing he regrets is that his father is not wrong to see him establish his records and do so well in, in the game that his father loved and, that, and taught him to like so much in his embryonic years. I mean, um, somebody could have a play, the play could be in the air and you're in the middle of, of all these other people, I mean, and after cricket. Joey Carew, a lacerating West Indies opening batsman in the 1960s, now executive manager of Trinidad's Queen's Park Club, was to play an increasingly significant role in Lara's development. Friend, coach, advisor, almost surrogate father. Um, a great deal, in great depth, and decided that it's, it's not serious to the cricket. But it was here, the Harvard Club, where Lara received his first formal coaching. His sister Agnes had spotted a newspaper advertisement inviting enthusiastic youngsters to come along. I think um, I did all the inspiration for people to get me into the game from very young. You know, I remember playing cricket with anything, marbles, uh, coconut branches, anything that I could put my hands on. And um, I think it was about age six that my sister saw it fit for me to attend a coaching clinic. And um, I never really lose any interest in the game. I also played soccer. But cricket was number one. And um, when I had to make a choice, you know, of course I choose cricket. And um, I saw it that way all my life. And that was one of the lucky ones where, you know, at school I was really excelling at cricket. So the inspiration was there just to keep going year after year, cricket season after cricket season, until I reached the top. I don't think that it was a surprise to anyone who, who looked at cricket and colleges cricket, as we call it here, that he would turn out to be the sort of player he is. So to say, yeah, uh, at an early age at college, I saw that he had that potential. Potential. Aged just 15, Lara was already playing for Trinidad against Barbados in the fiercely competitive under-19 inter-island competition in the Caribbean. He had a very good cricket brain from, uh, from that age. You know, his all cricket was extremely good. Um, his running between the wickets, his catching, his returns to the wicket. And although he was a very small boy, he had good arms, you know, like shoulders and elbows. From that age, you know, he was, he, he was cricket personified. Brian Lara was more aggressive, but his lack of size and power restricted him to just two boundaries. The pair batted out the hour before lunch and most of the period before tea, adding 89 and taking the score from 47 for two to 136. I think that he's a very nice boy. I have watched him from the time he started when he first came to Barbados, playing in the Sagari Sobers International School Boys Competition. And from that day that I saw him, I was shouting his praise, and I was saying to people that he's going to be the best player the West Indies and the world has ever seen. And people laughed at me. People said, oh, he's got ability, but he's not that good. Now proof of this man's sheer genius for ball games. In 1993, he became obsessed with golf, but decided to play it right-handed. To those of us who still can't play it either-handed after half a lifetime, it's quite bewildering. But his reasoning was utterly professional. Would left-handed golf impair his left-handed batting technique? He wouldn't risk it. 
His batting technique, incorporating the enormously high backlift that generates the ferocious power, is of almost surgical precision. Bowlers are cast as cannon fodder. I think that he is the type of player that is always looking to hit the ball. He's always trying to get the bat behind the ball. He's always looking to score runs. His technique is good. His movement, he has good eyesight, and he picks the ball up early. And he's always in a position to play the shot. But I think that um, the back lift only emphasizes how quick he sees the ball and how quick he can get it down. And he picks it up so early that the back lift doesn't really restrict him at all. He hits the ball so hard, he's, he's not a big fella, and he hasn't got a particularly heavy bat, but he hits the ball so hard because he has a very high back lift and very fast hands. He gets the bat down quickly, which is going to generate power. You look at other batsmen try and do that, and they'll swing themselves off balance and they'll fall over. And Brian swings the bat that hard, but maintains his, his, his style and his technique um, in doing it uh, because he's got such balance. His footwork is so good and his balance is, is that of a of a ballerina, probably. Who was snapped more times in 1994 than Princess Diana? Brian Lara. Graham Morris, a renowned sports cameraman, followed him around the world. In one innings alone, the record-breaking 375 in Antigua, he was forced to photograph him more than 700 times. One way is very easy, because obviously he stays in for a long time, so you get more goes at it. But uh, can be, it can be hard work. It can get through a lot of film. He's got such a high back lift that every shot he plays, every ball he faces, he looks like he's going to hit it out of the ground. It all happens so quickly. Uh, trying to photograph him, you've certainly got to be on your toes. The genius was a birthright, the technique acquired. But there's another quality needed to surmount the enormous competition in West Indies cricket. I'm still trying to put my finger on what exactly is the reason for the success of the last seven months. But I think that um, a lot have to do with the determination that I have to succeed. You know, I always wanted to succeed and I always wanted to pick up the newspapers the next day and if the West Indies won or if Warwickshire won, that I was the one that, you know, had a lot to do with it. Lara issued a gale warning in Guyana early on in 1994, 167 against England in the second test. But it was Antigua once a haven for Nelson's men of war, now the world's most extrovert cricket venue where history was to be made. Not that there was any early hint of it. West Indies made a ghastly start. They were 11 for one, then 12 for two. What Lara did have on his side was time. He made the most of it. Astonishingly, next morning, Lara got his eye in not at the nets, but on the golf course. Diehards were blanched at the very thought of it, but the conventional is not necessarily the way of genius. Down that second day, he batted on and on, seemingly infallible, until this time at the close, he was 320 not out, 45 runs short of the record. This was not conducive to a good night's sleep. I was up at four o'clock in the morning trying to see exactly how I'm gonna get this next 46 runs. You know, are you gonna push it into the gaps and get 46 singles, or are you gonna go out there and you know, hit three fours, and when you get to 350, then look for the next 15 runs, pushing singles. So I was playing my inning since four o'clock in the morning. So Gary Sobers arrived. Was this to be his dethronement day from the head of an eminent roll of honor? Seven batsmen stood ahead of Lara when play resumed. One by one, he picked them off. Only Sobers remained as Lewis ran into bowl. He hooked it. And he has broken the world individual test record with a hook before to the mid-wicket boundary. There is an invasion of police and spectators who have surrounded... Well, I've never seen Sir Gary play cricket, but what everyone has told me, he's the greatest all-rounder ever, and some have even said he's the greatest batsman that ever played cricket. And um, to pass his milestone of 365 is the greatest uh, feeling I've ever had. This is the happiest moment of my life. That single shot was also to transform his life. It's hard to know whether he'd even imagined the turmoil that was to envelop him after this almost papal gesture. People may find it strange to say, but it seemed also inevitable. Um, and that's not a criticism of our bowlers. 
um, because at times I felt we bowled as well as possible, but the wicket was very flat. And Brian Lara set his sights on a big total. Uh, and it's the biggest compliment to him to say that it looked also inevitable at the time. I don't think it sank in on that day. Um, of course, in the heat of the moment, you're batting and stuff like that, and, um, you know, you break a world record. But I think, preceding that, you know, you realise that, you know, what exactly you've done. I mean, the media made you realise. I mean, the headlines and stuff like that was really great. Spectators that morning had turned up at 8 o'clock. VIPs flew in from everywhere. Television beamed it live to the world, and Graham Morris's pictures were flashing round the globe. The triumphal return to Trinidad was no excuse for a nationwide party. It was genuine. And just as everyone recalls where they were when J.F. Kennedy was shot, everyone knew where they were when Lara broke the record. Among them, Gordon Draper, cabinet minister in the Trinidad government. I was in church. I was attending the funeral of one of our parliamentary colleagues. The entire cabinet was actually there. And while we listened to the scores as we went down to the, the funeral, we were actually in the church when he scored the runs. And we were getting the scores passed into us from the security so that we kept abreast of it, although we were taken up with the funeral at, at, the, at the same time. I think the population was jubilant. And there continues to be a sense of buoyancy, particularly in the sporting fraternity, you know, because of what Brian has done. And one, in fact, senses a, a resurgence, you know, of, of interest among young people in sport generally. So that I think that he has done a lot for the youth in particular and for the country in terms of the psyche of the people. Being famous is quite difficult um, because it's a small country and everybody knows you. So it's, it puts pressure on you. You know, they expect you to be looking great all the time. They expect you to be on your P's and Q's at all times. You know, best behavior every single time as you go anywhere in public. At the same time, it's also nice to be appreciated by your fellow countrymen. So there's the good side and the bad side. Most Caribbean islands have an independent square. Trinidad's was being refurbished, so part of it was instantly named Lara Promenade. The name had a talisman quality. Even a dispirited-looking racehorse named Lara thought it had better buck up in the Trinidad Derby. 200 metres to race, and it's lashed them Lara. Shot call, Da Vinci gaining with every stride, but it's Dale Whitaker on lash them Lara. Shot call is there. Here comes Da Vinci staying on a bit too late, but it's going to be lash them Lara the post. A winner under Dale Whitaker from shot call, Da Vinci. Fourth place goes to... The birthday. The bat. The Brian. The Bitters. The best. Brian and Bitters. The best it can be. For 30 minutes each week, the Caribbean starts, looks, and learns. For 30 minutes each week, through the Caribscope, we see each other's lives, our joys, and our sorrows. 30 minutes each week on Caribscope. Six days after his test record, Lara flew to England to join Warwickshire. His 375 commemorated on the scoreboard of the ground, now populated by press photographers. Warwickshire had signed him before his test record for a reported bargain fee of £40,000. I just thought that, you know, a lot of people might get carried away, you know, and um, expect too much. So I think I should remind them exactly, it's a sport you're playing and it takes one ball to get you out. And a lot of great players have gone through a lot of bad periods in their life. and. Um, I wouldn't like to disappoint anyone, but I would like them to understand that if this do happen to me, that they can support it. This is a Warwick's first team cap, Brian, and congratulations. Against long tradition, Laura was awarded his county cap before he'd scored a run. But he was greeted by a notice that warned him he would have to be one of the boys. It said something like, because um, it was actually me who wrote it, welcome to the second best left-hander, and... Uh, I think 
he's proven me otherwise. From day one, his form with Warwickshire was monumental. It was only 11 days since his Antigua innings, but he'd started with a century, then another, and another, and another. Indeed, five centuries in his first six innings. What was his influence on the team? I said, look, he's a great player. There's no doubt about that. You can learn from him. Stay with him at the other end. He is a great player. He could go on to be anything. He could go on to be the next uh, Sir Garfield Sobers, Sir Donald Bradman. And uh, they've done that. They've learned a lot from a marvellous player. In the West Indies, the Red Stripe Cup is only five weekends of cricket. You know, you're very hungry to succeed during that short period to impress the selectors. And um, cricket here is a bit different where, you know, it's a lot of cricket. You've got a lot of time to, you know, get your act together, get in form, succeed. If you're out of form, you know, you still have five months to sort it out. Well, obviously, a man who's just scored five centuries in six innings needs to sort out why he only got 26 in the other one. And Lara certainly did. In his very next knock, he was to stand English and world cricket on its head. Against Durham at Edgbaston, he appeared to have been bold, but it was a no do It was also the 50th anniversary of D-Day. One should not compare the heroism of battle with sport, but this was less sport than murder. Brian came to me at lunchtime, and at uh, this stage, I'm, I'm not sure how many he was on even, you know, 150 or something, but he came to me and said, uh, Skip, uh, you're not going to declare? Uh, are you, you know, the, the world record's 501, something like that? So he actually had his sights set on it at lunchtime. You know, he still needed another 350. <laughs> and uh, I said, right, Brian, as long as you're there, I won't declare. When you get out, I'll probably, you know, declare and we'll have a bowl. And, uh, and then I just sat down and, and watched him go on and on and on and score 100 after 100, five of them, and get 501. It was just an amazing innings. Passing 275, because I would always like to pass that at some time. And that was definitely on my mind. And um, I was working towards it. At the start of the day, Lara had been 111 not out. At lunch, he was actually 285. At tea, he was 418. When the day's last over began, he was just too short of the world record on 497. He blocked the first three balls, missed the fourth, and then waited for the fifth. <laughs> 501 not out, the highest ever score in first-class cricket. He was three hours faster than Hanif had been over his 499, and he'd broken 21 other records along the way. 499 was broken, so 501 will be broken, but let's see after how many years, because my record was uh, broken after 35 years, and uh, this one, uh, 501, rec records uh, has to be broken, I think, and uh, it's good for the game. A scorer for Warwickshire and England, Alec Davis had audited both great records, a little matter of 876 runs for one side. What staggered everyone, particularly his colleagues, was that Lara was so infernally casual. I admire that he can turn up sort of half an hour before a game and walk out and score, you know, superb 197 like he did against Curtly Ambrose at Northampton that time. Um, he's not the most punctual of guys, but he's... But, you know, when he, when he comes to the wicket, he's the most determined and, and forthright individual you'll ever see. And he's certainly, certainly the best player I've ever seen. And, I, you know, this year has been a great benefit to me.